Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Sharjah Entrepreneurship Festival 2020. It's a different year this year, and yet we are excited for the opportunities to continue talking about the importance of entrepreneurship across the world with leading speakers and guests visiting Sharjah virtually this year. I am deeply honored uh, to be able to have with us today Dr. Jane Goodall who for most people will understand her as a certified hero in her field. Through her career that has spanned over 60 years, she's become a household name synonymous for fighting for the rights of animals and the environment. I'm honored and, and grateful uh, to the Sharjah Entrepreneurship Center for this opportunity to speak with Dr. Goodall today on a fireside chat titled, Our Future, A Collective Responsibility. In a digital world, there are less fireplaces and more likely interruptions from young children. So apologies if they end up on my screen today, but I'm happy to have her with us today so we can talk to the next generation, a generation of young and inspired conservationists, environmentalists, and entrepreneurs looking to make a difference for our world. Dr. Goodall, welcome to Sharjah Digitally and thank you so much for joining. Well, thank you very much, Sheikh Fahim. And uh, it's a great honor for me to be here talking with you and I've read about all the wonderful things going on. And um, so it, I, I'm sure we're going to have a fantastic fireside chat. Although, you know, in these days of climate change, we hear the word fire and we shudder because of the wildfires that are raging around the world. But we'll have a wonderful chat. Indeed. Yeah. Um, if I could start, it's very with somebody that has seen as much as you have and impacted the world as much as you have, perhaps we can link to three themes that are in discussion today. Number one, perhaps we talk about the environment, your work and conservation and what it means for you. Second, maybe a theme around entrepreneurship and what young entrepreneurs can do for the future to put the environment and our planet at the center of, of their ambitions. And then lastly, maybe in a more positive sense, talk less about the pandemic, but a post-pandemic world and how the new normal will be shaping the way that people like yourselves with your philanthropy and, and young entrepreneurs will be moving forward. So maybe we'll start with the first one and talking about the importance of making change in the environment. If you were to talk to a young entrepreneur today that is looking to change the world and be a hero in their own right, in 2020, what are the pressing issues and, and where should we be focusing? I suppose that if I was talking to such a person right now, you know, we're still battling the pandemic. Britain's gone into lockdown again. It's spreading right across the United States. And I think that I, I would start off by saying, you know, this pandemic that has brought so much suffering and loss of life, loss of jobs, economic chaos everywhere, the, the tragedy is we brought it on ourselves by our disrespect of the natural world and our disrespect of animals, creating conditions where we sell wildlife from all over in wildlife markets in, in Asia, bushmeat markets in Africa. There's the international growing trade in exotic animals as pets, which takes all these animals um, into people's homes. And Every situation I've described, along with our intensive animal factory farms, these create environments for a virus, in this case COVID-19, to spill over from an animal to a human. This time it's created this COVID-19 pandemic. And, you know, as we emerge from the pandemic, as we shall, they're getting close to a vaccine, I hear, then we, we're going to have to come back and confront the far greater threat to our future, which of course is climate change. And that again is due to disrespect of the environment. So I would want to say to the young entrepreneur, you know, for so long, we have been destroying the natural world of which we actually are a part and on which we depend. And that it's absolutely crazy to think we can have unlimited global economic development on a planet with finite natural resources. And so already we're beginning to use up those resources in some places faster than mother nature can repair them. So I would want to talk to some, any young person really, 
about thinking, you know, how we've gone wrong and what we can do to change that situation. Dr. Goodall, you started your career a hero in your own right at a time in the world where perhaps there were not as many women in the sciences. Speaking here in Sharjah, which is the United Arab Emirates capital of, of culture and education and innovation, do you see a, a need for you know, young men and women to really be focusing uh, on the sciences going forward when the world is telling us solely to focus on technology? I, I think we need to focus, absolutely. We, you know, we need to focus on what we can learn from nature itself. Uh, we need to focus on science, but certain types of science, the kind of science, the technology that can create, and, um, that can create uh, equipment that will help us live in greater harmony with nature. Um, and we need, we need to focus on those things that are really important for the future and not carry on and on working in ways that we used to think were perfect in the past. You know, we don't want to go on developing ways of searching for new oil and gas. We want to fight for new technology that will lead us away from fossil fuel, which of course is an interesting topic in the, um, in the United Arab Emirates, um, but into clean green energy. And we need to focus on somehow creating the sort of planet that I would feel happier to leave to my descendants and to be making decisions based on how will this decision, how will this technology, how will this new development, how will it affect future generations? Not just me now, not just the bottom line. And so, that science, yes, but not all science, <clears throat> new science, clean, green energy type of science. If we can double click on that, you started your career at a time when we didn't have smartphones. And being of the older generation myself, you brought the world of primatology and, and the animal world to our screens. Something that was magical, impactful, and something that was extremely important uh, to, to young people that love the animal kingdom like myself. Today, we're in a different world. Today, everybody is aware of the impacts on our planet due to social media and smartphones and the proliferation of images um, at our fingertips. What excites you today in primatology? What excites you today in technology where you would say this could be the future for better understanding and having a better impact on our relationship with the animal world on the planet? Well, mm, that's, a, <laughs> that's a lot of questions all wrapped up right. in one. And by the way, I'm a lot older than you. When I was growing up, there wasn't even television. There were no screens and I, everything was from books. And it wasn't just that there were no women in things like primatology in the field. There was nobody, there was just nobody. Uh, when I first went to Africa in 1957, it was, you know, it was a different world. There were animals everywhere. It was untouched nature. It was the Africa of my dreams. And so what do I find exciting about primatology or for that matter, any studies in the field? What is exciting is what we still have to discover. And it's desperately important to protect the environment because species are becoming extinct before we have discovered the mystery of their existence. And for example, I began the research with the chimpanzees in Tanzania in 1960. 60 years later, we are still learning from that same group of chimpanzees, new things. And it was chimpanzees because they're so like us biologically, you know, we share 98.6% of DNA with them. And they're so like us um, behaviorally as well, kissing, embracing, holding hands, patting one another, swaggering, males competing for high rank, rather like some human politicians, uh, close bonds between family members, true altruism, but also unfortunately, the same dark side that we have of violence and war. When I'd been with the chimpanzees two years, 
I went to Cambridge University for the first time. I hadn't been to college, but my mentor, Dr. Lewis Leakey, said there was no time for an undergraduate degree. So he got me a place in Cambridge as the eighth person to go for a PhD without an undergraduate degree. And I was terrified. And imagine how I felt when the scientists of whom I was in awe, the professors, told me I'd done everything wrong. I shouldn't talk about the chimpanzees with names, they should have numbers. And I couldn't talk about personality or mind or emotion because those were unique to us. But I'd been taught as a child, I had a wonderful teacher who taught me that in this respect, these learned professors were wrong. And where is he? That was my dog, Rusty. So you can't share your life. And I'm quite sure you would agree with any animal. I don't care what animal and not know that, of course, we're not the only beings with personalities, minds and emotions. And it was because of, because of the chimpanzees who were in a way my, my allies that science was forced to come out of that reductionist way of thinking. And that opened the whole wonderful array of other animals who are also intelligent, who also have emotions. And those things are being studied today. And if we want to create a better world and live in harmony with nature, we need to understand more about the living beings who make up this amazing complex web of life. And I learned a lot about that in the hours I could spend alone in the rainforest, learning that every little species, no matter how small, has a role to play in this incredible web of life. And, you know, that's, that knowledge that I gained there, I also had a spiritual connection with the natural world. And we are becoming, with all these gadgets that you talked about, smartphones and video games, our young people are getting divorced from the natural world. And this is a real tragedy because unless you have experience of something and not just on a screen, although that's a big help, but actual physical experience yourself, you can't really learn to love and then want to protect. So all of what I learned and I'm still learning every day, I try to learn something new, um, makes me more concerned about the future, but at the same time, more passionate to do everything I can to ensure a better future for my grandchildren and theirs. In your response to this phenomenally groundbreaking work, you mentioned your mentor, Louis Leakey, who famously said then that we must now redefine man, redefine tool, and learn to accept chimpanzees as humans. Can you speak to how we interpret this blurry relationship between the human, you know, humans and our natural world? And you, you mentioned how complex it is. What, what does this mean when we talk about diversity loss? How do we redefine a conversation that puts the needs of local communities and society on par with the need to protect this beautiful diversity and complexity that's on our, uh, on our planet? Well, I think that in order to do this, and we have experience of that with the Jane Goodall Institute, so I can address it directly from, you know, from my own experience. And that is when I first realized how chimpanzee numbers were dropping across Africa as forests were destroyed, as they were hunted, for the live animal trade for bushmeat uh, and so on. I, I got together a little bit of money. Money's always been a problem in everything I've done. And got to, I think it was six different range states for chimps and I learned a lot about their problems. But I learned too about the plight of so many Africans living in and around chimpanzee habitat, the crippling poverty, the lack of good health and education facilities, the degradation of the land, the growing human populations along with their cattle. And it came to a head when I flew over the tiny Gombe National Park. It's the smallest national park in Tanzania. I've forgotten now how big it is, but it's tiny. And when I began working there in 1960, it was part of this equatorial forest belt right across from Western East Africa to the West African coast. 
by 1990, it was a tiny island of forest surrounded by completely bare hills, more people living there than the land could support, too poor to buy food from elsewhere, farmland overused and infertile, terrible erosion because they were cutting down trees even on the steep slopes and their desperation to grow more food or make charcoal. And that's when it hit me. If we don't help these people find ways of living without destroying the, the environment, we can't help, hope to save chimpanzees, forests, any other animal, nothing, including the people. So we began our program called Take Care or Takari. And it started with 12 villages around the Gombe National Park. And not a bunch of arrogant white people marching into a poor village and telling them they'd mess things up. And this is what we're going to do to help you, no, no. It was a group of local Tanzanians known to the villagers who went in and listened to the villagers and asked, what can we do best to help you? And that's where it began. And gradually the villagers came to trust us and realize we weren't one of these NGOs that sweep in, do their stuff or somebody wanting a PhD, collecting facts and going away and leaving nothing behind. So we could introduce water management programs, restoring fertility to the land, working with the Tanzanian government to improve health and education facilities. Then uh, one of my heroes is Muhammad Yunus, who developed the Grameen Bank. So we introduced microcredit opportunities, especially for women to choose environmentally sustainable businesses, small businesses, um, to empower them. And almost all of them have paid back. So when they pay back, they can take out another loan, but they're proud because they've done it. It's not like handing out money, which gets used up and then the hand comes out again. No, they're proud, it's mine, I've done it, I've succeeded. They're empowered. And scholarships to keep girls in school during and beyond puberty, because it's been shown everywhere as women's education goes up, family size tends to drop. And certainly all around where I've worked in Africa, the number of young children tied in with the poverty is, is a real problem. But anyhow, this Takari program, as we call it, is now in all 104 villages throughout Chimp Range in Tanzania. And it's very important that we've introduced very high tech uh, use of cell phones, satellite imagery, and the villages send out volunteers to workshops so that they can monitor themselves, the health of their village forest reserves, where most of the chimps live unprotected. And so they're very proud of this and it all gets uploaded into a platform in the clouds. You know, so introducing this modern technology to actual work on the ground, planting trees, leaving the land fallow so the forest can spring back, uh, has made these villagers understand that protecting the environment is for their own future, not just for wildlife. So they've become our partners in conservation. And this program is now in six other African countries around chimpanzee habitat. And it's already now to scale up because it can work anywhere. It doesn't have to be just chimpanzees. So as I say firsthand, I've seen the way to live in harmony is to work with the people, to have the people, the local community, on your side, helping to work out how to protect nature. And therefore, this creates the harmony that we all seek for between people and animals, between nature and technology. It all comes together. I'm fascinated, and I'm sure our viewers are fascinated by Dr. Jane Goodall using the term scaling up in front of a lot of young entrepreneurs that are excited to do the same with their businesses. But perhaps that's a perfect opportunity, Dr. Goodall, for us to go into that second theme, which is you've had this unique experience to visit and, and, and engage with a magical part of the world and a man, magical um, animal like the chimpanzee and, and bring that to the world. Thinking locally, some people may not consider their local environment as beautiful, as important. 
but in Sharjah, the Environmental and Protected Areas Authority have done a lot to safeguard endangered species. We have more um, protected areas than most countries in the region. Um, perhaps, you know, you can give us uh, your view on how the change makers that are attending today can engage with their local communities. And while they may not have rainforests with chimpanzees, do something closer to home to, to help protect this great cause. Yes, absolutely. It's incredibly important. And, you know, fortunately, we all live in different places with different environments. And it's, you know, these ecosystems around the globe that make life on planet Earth so absolutely fascinating. So, you know, some organisms are adapted to the rainforest, some have evolved in the deserts, some have evolved down in the depth of the ocean. And it's, this is what creates this mosaic of absolutely fascinating life on earth. And we work a lot with young people, as I think you know, with our so-called Roots and Shoots program. And they're using citizen science in the area around them to log the different kinds of plants and animals, the insects, the birds, the little mammals, and get an idea of the rich diversity, even around and even in a city. And so it's only when everybody cares about their local environment and strives to protect their local environment and strives to protect and restore whatever environment it is, then we start healing the planet. Then we start creating a blueprint for the future. And this is what I find exciting, that, that even in the inner city, there is life, even in the inner city. Like I just learned, I told you I like learning something new every day. And I read about a colony of ants in a very busy part of New York, and they live under the cracks in the pavement, and they do an incredible job because they swarm out, and people, you know how ghastly people throw bits of food away and that sort of thing. The ants clear it all up. And this in turn reduces the population of rats because there's less food for them. And this is all about the interweaving of nature. And when we learn about it, you know, we get more and more impressed with the, the resilience of nature and the, I don't know what, whether to call it, it's like nature is an entrepreneur itself. These ants are entrepreneurs. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Guru, if, if you allow me and indulge me on trying to weave two topics together. Shira, as at the Entrepreneurship Center here in Sharjah, is known for its um, very strong purpose out to help entrepreneurs start the business of their dreams and succeed. And, and we're very proud that they have just been, um, you know, awarded as, as the sort of leading ecosystem in the region. But having been an entrepreneur myself, I appreciate the pressure that's put on attaining profit. In today's world, from what we've heard from you, that it's just as important to have purpose. What would your advice be to a young entrepreneur that is trying to balance profits with purpose and trying to make sure that they are making a positive impact on the planet rather than just uh, trying to you know, uh, increase revenue or try to you know, increase that bottom line? Unfortunately, business schools um, and indeed a lot of education systems try to push young people into business school and the, F, the, the, you know, the emphasis is on you've got to make money. It's the bottom line that matters. If you want to be successful, you've got to grow and grow and grow. And so, you know, in, in my view, this is a sort of business as usual that absolutely will destroy us if we carry on with it. And yes, we, we all or most of us need money to live, but it goes wrong when you live for money. And, you know, you talked about leaving this to the end of the conversation, but it fits in here to think that as we emerge from this pandemic and think about creating a post-pandemic world, and as I say, we come face to face with the much greater threat of climate change, and so we desperately need to come together, first of all, to create a new relationship with the natural world and animals.
try and prevent future pandemics, try and save the ecosystem. And it's perhaps even more important and perhaps very relevant to your young entrepreneurs. Somehow we have to get together to create a different kind of more sustainable economy and a greener economy. And perhaps we need to redefine success, which at the moment in the minds of most of these young entrepreneurs is growth, economic growth. That's the measure of success. And when you look at companies like Amazon and, and so many of them, you know, they're great sprawling giants and they've destroyed, destroyed so many small enterprises. And I, I think that they, they, they shouldn't be, we shouldn't, we shouldn't encourage one company to grow so big and so powerful and crush the people who want to make a living, to have enough, to have time to enjoy nature and their family and friends. And I've seen it in Africa, you know, people say, oh, these, this community, it's so poor. Well, they have their little fields, they have enough food, their kids go to the local school, and you go there in the evening, and they're sitting around these tiny little fires, they're laughing and they're singing. In other words, they're happy. So how do we create a world where people are happy and feel successful and are regarded as being successful when they have enough? Dr. Goodall, it's fascinating to hear you speak about this, especially as I'm sure everybody watching and listening today have their own you know, experience with um, a lockdown or the pandemic uh, that really shook our world. If I focus on one of your points and, and, and realize that this pandemic could be an opportunity as a reset button for us to rethink what we do going forward, what would you say um, the post-pandemic world looks like for conservation? What does this mean when people suddenly realized and took stock of the amount of you know, pollution that was being created when we weren't in lockdowns, when we realized how much disruption was caused to these people that you talk about with these, these livelihoods. Um, do you see a challenging way forward or do you see opportunities to, to connect with potential uh, conservationists, and, uh, conservationists and, and, and taking care of our planet going forward? Well, I think I see opportunities. I certainly see a situation where if we don't seize these opportunities, if we don't seek change, we are literally spelling doom for the future of life on planet Earth and our own species included. And I see a, an, an opportunity, well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not an economist, but I've talked to many people who are thinking about this brave new world. And, you know, the enormous number of jobs that can be created through clean green energy and some of these other um, companies and these other opportunities. Uh, I wouldn't know about that. I, I just know we need to do it. And I leave it to others, especially all these young entrepreneurs, to work out ways to do it. And, you know, talking about investing in young people with good ideas, I just read this morning about a group of university students. And we've just been told that the uh, what do you call it, when cars drive along the road, the, 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 the stuff that flies off the tires all the time is little micro plastic bits. And they've just worked out a way of controlling those micro plastics so that the, the tire damage will not uh, cause so much pollution. In fact, it's said to cause more pollution than burning of the fossil fuel. And so that, what an amazing group to to invest in if this is right. And there are so many young people I know who have fantastic ideas and sometimes they're laughed at, that can never work. But the people who support these ideas, the investors, sometimes they really do support something that makes a huge difference. I know uh, somebody who does this uh, venture capitalism investing in Los Angeles and he supported a young Brazilian who thought that he could find a way or that he had thought of a way of controlling crop pests 
without pesticides. And as you know, pesticides, chemical ones, are destroying the soil. <laughs> That's our future too. So it was something that had been done before, but not quite in this way. It was disrupting the pheromones given out by a female moth, and moths are the main predator, uh, main pest of, of row crops, they call them. And uh, putting this stuff in a little bag, and one acre took 40 little bags, which gave employment to the local people, no pesticides, and it's resulted in 80% higher crop yield where it's been tested in Tanzania, Uganda, I think Ethiopia, and different parts of the US. So those are the kind of things which might sound crazy, but my goodness, what a difference. And that's one investor supporting one young man and his company. Dr. Goodall, I think most of the young entrepreneurs that are listening will finally realize that they share so much in common with you and that they understand how difficult it is to fundraise at times <laughs> for their bright ideas. Um, but you fundraise uh, in your philanthrop uh, philanthropic work. Um, and perhaps this is a, that time to talk about a post-pandemic world and maybe the challenges of the pandemic. Um, if you could talk to us a little bit about your program what it was like during COVID and, and trying to continue those programs with such a big disruption. Um, and any advice you can give to people that are looking to start their own philanthropic work? Well, I'm not sure about the advice for those starting their philanthropic work, except that you know one measure of success in my book is to create enough money to make the world a better place, not to store up because you can't take it with you when you die. And you've probably already given enough to your kids, but you know, to, to, for a young person who wants to help the world, that's the kind of uh, philanthropy that I think is really, really important. So the pandemic, yes, it affected us badly because we wanted to try and prevent this COVID-19 getting into the chimp populations in Gombe and other parts where we study them because they're very susceptible to these respiratory diseases like influenza, for example, which is also a COVID virus, coronavirus. And um, so we also have to provide all our staff with masks or lay them off temporarily, uh, but try and continue to pay them. Gave us a lot of extra unplanned budgetary needs. We also have two sanctuaries for orphan chimpanzees whose mothers have been shot for various reasons. And those, again, we have to, you know, give the, the care, care, caregivers have to be properly uh, equipped so that they do not run any risk of passing a virus onto the chimpanzees that might, might wipe them all out. We don't know. Luckily, touch wood, cross fingers, no chimpanzee has caught it yet. So pray they won't. So that, that cost us, you know, a lot. And I know people who've had their whole lives blighted because they've lost their work. And I, I have no solution for all of this, except that hopefully there's enough philanthropy around the world. There's enough people who are, in spite of the pandemic, amassing fortunes, especially in the IT business, uh, that, that we could somehow help these people. But, you know, I read about those in India, for example, where the farmers make very little money. So except in the harvest season, they go into cities and they get horrible jobs, but just to get some money. I mean, can you think of anything worse than clearing out a pit latrine? I mean, awful things like that, but they're desperate. So they do it. But when COVID came, they were all these, they, they were shut down. So they couldn't carry on with what they were doing to earn this little bit of money. They all had to go back to their villages. And that led to horrible uh, poaching, killing, revenge killing of elephants. And you can understand a poor farmer, he's got his little field, he's got a crop, he's barely surviving with his family and the elephants come along and destroy it just like that. Well, of course he's going to be angry. And the elephants, who've had more and more of their habitat destroyed and they see some nice crops, of course they're going to eat them. 
So you, you understand both sides. And that's where we need the young people, the entrepreneurs to come in with ideas. What do we do? How do we address these two very different situations to create harmony? And those are things that we, we're going to have to confront more and more and more as we destroy more habitat. So it becomes more important to restore habitat, to grow more trees, to absorb more carbon dioxide, to clean up the pollution of the ocean so that they can do their job of absorbing CO2 and uh, not become more and more acidic. I mean, all of these things, aren't they all interrelated? Don't you think so? Indeed, um, Dr. Goodall, I mean, this for, for me gives me hope. And I think, um, you know, in a post pandemic world, it, it's one thing that we should be holding on to. But I'm also a young uh, father with two children who are three years old, who are going to, you know, graduate and try to get a job or be an entrepreneur in the year 2038. And you've often said that conservation without education is ineffectual to change. What advice would you give to young parents and young children on learning more about the environment and perhaps talk about Roots and Shoots that has a UAE chapter to, to make sure that the next gener generation of entrepreneurs are more aware of their environment, are more aware of the challenges ahead, and perhaps will come up with those solutions to change? Yep. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Roots and Shoots because I would have mentioned it anyway. It is much nicer than you mention it for me. So it began... And I'll start off with this because it, it fits right in with what you're talking about. So it began in 1991. I was already traveling around the world, raising awareness, and at the same time, trying to raise funds for our Africa programs, conservation, um, you know, community-based conservation as well. And I was meeting so many people, particularly young people like high school, university, who didn't seem to have much hope for the future. And some of them were depressed. Some of them were angry. Some of them, most of them were just apathetic. They didn't seem to care. And I always loved working with youth. So I began talking to them. And they all said more or less the same. We feel like this because you've compromised our future and there's nothing we can do about it. Well, we've not only compromised the future of our young people, the ones that you're talking about, your children, and theirs, we've been stealing their future. And we're still doing it today to some extent. But is it too late? Were they right when they said there was nothing they could do about it? No. I firmly believe, and luckily I'm not the only scientist to believe this, there's a lot of support that we have a window of time, but we need to take action. We have a window of time when if we get together and use our intellect, we can start redressing some of the harm that our very intellect has very often created. And so, so okay, so the, the uh, young people, I tried to give hope to and say, look, it's not too late. There's a lot that you can do. The 11, 12 high school students who came to me with all their problems, not just environmental, but what about the street children with no homes? What about the cruel treatment of stray dogs? That sort of thing. So they got their friends together and we created Roots and Shoots, which had as its main message, every single one of us, all of us, we make some kind of impact on the planet every single day. And unless we're living in abject poverty, when we have no choice, we can choose, what do we buy? Where did it come from? Did it harm the environment? Was it cruel to animals? Um, is it cheap because of child slave labor somewhere or inequitable wages? And if the answer is yes, go and buy it so that consumer pressure is beginning to change the practice of business and business because of its relationship with government and so often corruption, uh, business can actually change government as well. So young people can change their parents. We've seen it happen again and again and again. And their grandparents, and some of those parents and grandparents may be decision makers who with the stroke of a pen can make a huge difference. So anyway, 
we decided this, that the main message was each one of us makes a difference in our own way. And we decided that each group, because of the interrelationship of all living things, each group, would they would choose. It wasn't a top down. They would choose projects to make things better for people, animals, and the environment. And so what began with these 12 high school students is now in 68 countries. I don't think it's in Sharjah yet. I hope it will be. It's in Abu Dhabi and Dubai, I know. And um, so it's now in 68 countries. It's got members in kindergarten, even preschool. Your kids could be involved. And of course they need guidance. Um, university, very strong and everything in between. And I tell you, they are changing the world even as we speak. It's my greatest reason for hope. And yes, we see young entrepreneurs in university doing things like the tire uh, catching of the microplastics, like I mentioned, but so many more things. And there was a little kid in, in um, a Maasai kid in Kenya, and he worked out a system of flashing lights to keep lions away from the livestock at night so he didn't have to stay awake all night. He got, he was 10 years old in the middle of nowhere. And of course, some company came along and snatched it away. And I don't know that he was compensated, but he thought of it. So young people, I see all over the world, they're rising to this challenge. We never had to face it. I mean, actually, I grew up in World War II and I learned not to take anything for granted. I learned the value of every mouthful of food. I learned that life was, friends, relatives were being killed. And I'm glad that I grew up at that time because I understand there's a lot of young children growing up today, it's not their fault, but they know nothing but having everything they need. And so they become selfish. It's not their fault. Um, I don't know whose fault it is, but I'm glad that the war experience prevented me from growing up selfish and enabled me to appreciate all the little things. You, something goes wrong and you think, yes, this is terrible, but gosh, it could be so much worse. So all of those things, so Roots and Shoots, truly, it's unbelievable what they are doing to change the world. Dr. Goodall, it's unbelievable with your selflessness what you have done to change the world. And for people watching today that want to walk away understanding their collective responsibility to our environment and walk away wanting to be inspired by a hero like yourself, what one bit of advice would you give them? If there's one thing they take away from this call. Well, I think probably it's what I've said to realize that every single day you make an impact. And although your single impact might not make any difference, when billions of people are making ethical choices in just how they live, and some people can make huge choices because of who they are and the society they were born into or the family they were born into, then, then you see us moving towards a much, much better world. And all that this pandemic has done is to kind of kickstart an effort to get together more quickly and work with more urgency to develop that better world for your great grandchildren and mine. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Goodall, for sharing your insights, your experiences, your advice with everybody um, watching from around the world and those in Sharjah today. Um, it's been inspirational. If I can end on a personal note, this has been the highlight of my career thus far. It has been an honor. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, wish you good health. And thank you so much for joining us with Shala at the Sharjah Entrepreneurship Festival. Well, thank you very, very much for inviting me. And I look forward to coming and meeting in person when this silly pandemic will allow such travel. And we won't have to be wearing masks when we meet. <laughs> we look so forward to that day. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.